Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the UFM Lou Douglas Lecture Series on Public Issues. My name is John Fleider, and I serve on the Lou Douglas Lecture Series Committee. For over 26 years, the Lou Douglas Lecture Series has brought thought-provoking speakers to our campus to discuss topics concerning human rights, social justice, international development, and other issues. The series was created to honor Lou Douglas, who is a distinguished professor of political science at Kansas State University from 1949 to 1977. Professor Douglas was widely known for his power to inspire students, faculty, and citizens to pursue social justice in politics, economics, and foreign policy. Lou was also an influential member of the UFM Community Learning Center for many years. Tonight's lecture by Professor David Mindich is co-sponsored by the A.Q. Miller School of Journalism and Mass Communications. The Lou Douglas Lecture Committee would like to thank the Student Activities Board, various academic departments, and community patrons for their annual, annual contributions to the series. Also, a special thank you to Provost Nellis for his continuing support of the series. There will be a question and answer session following the lecture. I encourage you to stay and interact with our speaker. You can come down to these two mics here and ask your question. If you have to leave immediately following the lecture, please do so quietly. In addition to the Q&A, there will be a book signing in the lobby following the lecture. And uh, you will also be able to purchase both books that uh, Professor Minich has uh, published. Okay. Please welcome Professor Todd Simon who is going to introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I've been looking forward to this uh, lecture date for about a year. Uh, it was almost a year ago that uh, Olivia Collins, who coordinates uh, scheduling and activities for the Lou Douglas series, gave me a call. I've known Oli Olivia for quite a while. And said, would the journalism school be interested in possibly co-sponsoring a Lou Douglas lecture? And the speaker we have in mind is David Mindich. And I said, basically, hot dog. That probably means he's going to come and talk about the history of objectivity in American journalism. Because uh, that was his first book, and I didn't know he'd published this second book at the time. Um, but I want to get a chance to bring that book up. If uh, I imagine a number of you have looked into Tuned Out, Why Americans under 40 don't follow the news, but that was preceded eight years ago by just the facts how objectivity came to define American journalism. Um, being familiar with that, that book, I was enthused when I found out he had a new book that addresses one of the key questions all of us in journalism education and in the practice of journalism are concerned about, I was even more enthused. And that question, which we pose um, to one another fairly regularly is, um, where's our audience going? Are people paying attention to news in the way that we as journalism educators or as practicing journalists would like them to do? Um, the main difference is uh, we asked that question and Professor Mindich went out and gathered the data, traveled the country, interviewed and surveyed a very large number of people to get the answers to those questions. And that's what he'll be speaking here about tonight. A little bit of quick background. Um, Professor Mindich is a professor in the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication at St. Michael's College <clears throat> in, in Colchester, Vermont, just outside of Burlington. He's been there pretty much since he fin finished his uh, PhD work. Um, says in the program that he is chair of that department, but he's recently relinquished those duties and seemed relieved to have done so. <laughs> professor Mindich got his, received his bachelor's degree from Brandeis University his master's and PhD from New York University in American Studies. Prior to his academic career, he worked with Cable News Network as an assignment editor in various periods, both before and during his academic work. He's also done ex worked extensively in publishing freelance material. In looking at the subject for tonight, 
It reminded me of a quote, so I went and searched it out, and sure enough, it was bound to be by one of my favorite people's, people from history. It was Thomas Jefferson in one of his letters. Jefferson said, whenever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. Mm. And now I introduce Professor David Mindich to tell us about how well informed the people are. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm uh, honored to be invited to give the Lou Douglas Lecture. Uh, and I want to thank Todd Simon for the invitation and the uh, UFM and the university um, as my hosts here. It's been a great day uh, going to classes and meeting with students. It's been really uh, extraordinary. I want to um, thank my hosts, but I want to apologize to them as well in advance. Because in addition to uh, talking for about half hour, 45 minutes, about why Americans, particularly young Americans, don't follow the news. I'm also going to be um, using a word that you don't usually use or usually hear in lectures like this. And um, the word, well, it's the F word. So um, bear with me, my apologies. We're in a crisis, um, that's for sure. Uh, earlier this year, one of the biggest newspaper chains, Knight Ritter, put itself up for auction. There was only one bidder. Um, and then McClatchy, who bought the, uh, the chain, um, didn't want to touch some of the most respected uh, newspapers in the country. Um, and paralleling that story is a story of a, a friend of mine who's 10 years younger than I am. I'm 43, she's 33, and she went from New York and moved to um, San Jose, California. And she met lots of people there. Um, she met people who shared her interest in knitting, uh, her interest in political issues, and she met friends who shared her various hobbies. She didn't meet them at all through the newspaper. She met them all through, any guesses from younger people in the audience? Craigslist. Um, she had to convince some of them that she w didn't want to get romantically involved with them. Um, but once she got over that hurdle, um, she, uh, she met a lot of interesting people. Coincidentally, one of those newspapers that were up for sale was the San Jose Mercury News, and it lost, maybe not coincidentally, tens of millions of dollars in advertising budget, in, in, ad in advertising money, especially in its classifieds. So we know that there's a big, uh, a big issue there. Um, one of the big issues relates to the four-letter F word, free, which isn't the F word that I'm thinking of. But um, the free content on the internet is compromising um, the paid content um, in newspapers. One of the oddest indicators of the huge change in journalism was the visit by John Stewart the uh, anchor of The Daily Show, to Crossfire, right? And you, uh, how many of you saw John Stewart's visit to Crossfire? Uh, raise your hand. Okay, how many of you saw it when it actually happened? Only a few people. So mainly it was uh, replays on the internet. Well, you guys remember what John Stewart said to the Crossfire people? He said, stop, you're hurting America. And it's not surprising that the CNN bigwigs would have taken that seriously because they were salivating over Jon Stewart's demographics. But what is surprising is that Jonathan Klein, the president of CNN, stood up at a press conference and said, I agree wholeheartedly with Jon Stewart's basic premise. I'm canceling Crossfire, which is you know, an amazing postmodern moment in which uh, a comedian cancels a news show. <laughs> so worried about this trend, I traveled all over the country um, and speaking with people from ages about 13 to 36. I've gone to California, Connecticut, Georgia, Indiana, Louisiana, Massachusetts, North Carolina, Minnesota, New Hampshire, New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and Washington State. Um, in speaking with small groups and in large groups with individuals and in 
uh, in bigger groups like this. I also met with journalists. I went to the uh, circulation and marketing department of the New York Times and I uh, spoke with them about how to market the New York Times to young people. It was right after the movie Sideways had just come out. Uh, how many of you guys saw Sideways? A few of you? They wanted to know about the images of the New York Times as depicted in Sideways. And I thought, what? You know, I don't remember the New York Times. And, but then I thought, you know, they said, oh yeah, remember when he orders a uh, frou-frou, um, you know, flavored latte um, and the New York Times? Um, they said, is the New York Times the kind of publication that, you'd, that people associate with flavored coffee? And I said, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, then the other thing is that he drove around, right, doing the crossword puzzle while he was in the car. So maybe that connotes a little danger and you know, uh, sexiness, I don't know. Um, but uh, then I met with a group of journalists about 20 journalists in New York City, and it was the president of CNN, the president of CBS News, the managing editors of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, all these top journalists um, sitting around a table trying to figure out how to get, well, you guys interested in the news. Um, and to show what a panic they were in, they also had a 20-something blogger, and the 20-something blogger, whenever they would talk, he would lean back and he'd say, you are the past. I am the future. And people would take notes and be really scared. <laughs> so we know that, uh, that we're in trouble if the news executives are, um, are so fearful. And I'm less interested in what this all means for the business of journalism, because that's something that the news executives can think about. But I'm more interested in what this all means for democracy. I think we can all agree, I hope everyone in this room agrees that all power, all political power, needs to be checked. I think the conservative Republicans in the room feel that um, all democratic power should probably be checked. And the liberal Democrats also would agree that, that all um, conservative Republicans should be checked. And who checks the power? Well, our government is set up and has a system of checks and balances. Um, Congress checks the presidency, um, although I think that everyone would agree that the Congress has been less of a check on the presidential power uh, in recent years. Uh, the Supremes have been somewhat of a check, right? Um, but maybe less so uh, in recent years. So who's the ultimate check on power, whether it's Democratic or Republican power? It's us, right? It's you and me informed by a vibrant and free press. And we, um, we have to think of our stake in the government as a kind of ownership stake. stake. Uh, I live in a uh, small town in, uh, well, the largest city in Vermont is 30,000 people. Um, and uh, down, the, down the highway is a city called Montpelier, which is the capital of Vermont. It's the only state capital without a McDonald's. Vermonters are kind of proud of that. Um, and it's the uh, only state capital building without a security guard checking um, you know, your, uh, your ID and things like that. So I'm walking with my son a few years back. He was seven years old at the time. And I want to show him the capital building in Montpelier. And he's holding my hand real tight, and he's getting a little nervous. And he says, Dad, I want to ask you, I don't think we should be in here. I said, yeah, yeah, it's OK to come in. You know? He said, no, no, I don't think we should be in here. I said, I said OK, I'll ask somebody. So we go over to the, gu uh, the guard. Well, there's no guard, right? So we go over to the, uh, this 20-something, uh, either he's a, a legislator or he's an aide, I'm not sure. He's walking down with a stack of papers down the hall. And I say, my son and I want to know, is it OK to be in here? And he said something that's really beautiful. He said, of course you can be in here. It's your house. And I mean, I think it's really beautiful. I hope my son, as I repeat the story over and over again to him, uh, starts to appreciate the beauty as well. Um, but it's that kind of ownership in our government and our country that we need to cultivate 
and I would argue is absent in America today. So I'd like to make six points today. Um, the first point I'd like to make is that most young people, not all, most young people are more tuned out than most of us can imagine. In 1972, half of all college-age students, half of all college-age Americans read a newspaper every day. Today it's one in five. And that's not really that important an issue because in college, you know, there's the college bubble and like in high school, maybe you're not fully invested in society. But the real issue is that 20-somethings and 30-somethings aren't following the news either. Um, in 1972, 75% of people in their mid-30s read a newspaper every day. Today, it's only a third. And why is this important? Well, it turns out that the news is one of those habits that you need to cultivate early or you never cultivate it at all. A few years ago, a New Yorker writer wrote... Um, asked the question, why am I still listening to the same music I was listening to when I was 20? And he was kind of maddened by this idea, you know, that he's listening to the same 70s music that he was listening to. Um, he's listening to it now, the same 70s music that he listened to in the 1970s. And uh, many of you who are young might um, think about how your parents have that equally maddening um, habit of listening to the same music that they listened to in the 70s. And maybe your parents are equally troubled by the thought that maybe you're going to still listen to the same music you're listening to now, right? So we're equally maddened uh, with each other's generation. Um, but um, he came to the conclusion that music is one of those habits you need to pick up by your mid-20s or you'll never pick it up. So if you have an eclectic habit, you might still remain eclectic over the course of your life. If you're only interested in top 40, well, we know that there are 70s stations that only play like the top 40 stuff from the 70s, right? So we know that that's true. He, incidentally, he also looked at two other habits. One was sushi eating, that if you haven't picked up the habit of eating sushi um, by your mid-20s, you probably won't. Anecdotally, I'm not sure if that's true. But the other one is um, body piercing. Not your ears, but like the other parts of your body. Um, and uh, so if you haven't pierced the other parts of your body and you've made it to 25, the chances are you won't, according to this research. Now, I can't really speak about those other body parts or the sushi or the music, but I do know that, that news appears to be a habit that you need to pick up young or you don't pick it up at all. And if, so if you're 35 and you're not following the news, you're entering the period of your life which you're, in which you're running the country, right? You're entering your, the decades of your heightened political power, economic power, and if you're entering those decades and you're not informed, we're in big trouble. What's the median viewer age of the evening news? Well, 10 years ago it was 50. Anyone want to guess what it is today? 55, that's a pretty good guess, it's 60. Uh, it depends on the news show, but typically it's about 60 years old. And if you don't believe me, turn on the news, the evening news, Kitty Couric even, um, in the next few weeks at some point, and don't watch the news, watch the commercials. Viagra, Fixident, Metamucil, Depends. <laughs> it's true, really. And if you look at these commercials, um, one thing that you have to know about advertisers is they try to reach the youngest segment of their audience, right? Because uh, my now nine-year-old hasn't sworn his lifelong allegiance to Coke or Pepsi. So they're trying to get him now, right? I already know what I'm, I'm drinking, right? Probably most of you have decided Coke or Pepsi or neither, right? So uh, we, the, the soft drink companies can't get you anymore. Um, so you're always trying to reach the youngest segment. So if you're advertising Metamucil and Fixident, the chances are you're in trouble, right? Um, okay, and so uh, the thing is that, that there are a lot of news executives really don't understand that people aren't going to start... Um, 
getting this news habit, but a few, a rare few, do. One is a guy named Richard Sambrook, who's the head of the BBC, and he said recently, one statistic that keeps me awake at night, we've been talking for a long time about the problem of getting people under 25 to watch more news, so we decided to see what happened as they get older. They don't watch. There's a generation go growing older which just doesn't sit down and watch the news as their parents did. I see this as a time bomb, he said. The, um, by the way, the Daily Show's median viewer age is 34. How about the internet? People, um, when I talk about what I'm doing at parties, they, the first thing they say is, oh, they're not reading the newspaper, they're watching TV news. And then I tell them the median viewer age, and they said, well, actually, they're just getting it off the internet. Um, and there are many people, and there might be many people in this room, who have a really deep um, understanding of news and politics uh, derived from the internet. And the internet is the greatest source of all time for news if you wanted to dive in deep. Um, the Russian uh, studies uh, dolphin intelligence. I mean, you know, you can get all the information about Russian studies of dolphin intelligence that you want, right? Uh, you can get all the the information you want about the news from Cyprus. Um, so you can dig deep, go wide, or go narrow on the internet. The problem is that for many young people, um, Facebook and MySpace um, dominate the internet experience. Um, that for many, instant messenger, um, entertainment news, and maybe some classwork, but uh, doesn't go really beyond that. So that we don't see the knowledge gap closing between the people who are older and the people who are younger. So in 2004, Americans were asked the question, do you happen to know the Democratic presidential candidate who was a general? And about 13% of young people knew it was Wesley Clark, and about 40% of older Americans knew. So there is this gap. Um, that is widening. In the 60s and 70s, um, young people knew almost as much as their elders. Now that gap has widened despite the internet. Why does this matter? Well, um, if you're not informed and people don't pay attention, they vote against their economic interests. I understand that um, Thomas Frank uh, came by and, and discussed um, this very issue. Um, they make choices based on patriotism or vague notions of who's taller, for example. There's a lot said, you know, who's taller, Bush or Kerry? You know, Kerry's taller. Oh, we're going to vote for him. You know, um, how many of you guys, just show of hands, um, believe that children should be left behind? <laughs> Two or three people in the back, okay. Uh, Really, there was a, someone, someone raised her hand in the back there. Um, so, um, yeah, so we all agree that children should not be left behind, right? Um, how many people are against clear skies? Same person in the back. Um, um, so we can agree that we're in favor of clear skies and not having... Um, children being left behind, but what do we think about the Clear Skies Initiative? What do we think about No Child Left Behind? You know, it may be that we agree or disagree, but we obviously, I think, can all agree, Democrats and Republicans, that we want our views based not on the slogans, which um, are very easy to, uh, uh, you know, to, to have a knee-jerk reaction to. What do you think about the death tax? You know, things like that. We, um, we need to move beyond those slogans and have enough information um, to make a decision on our own. The second point I want to make is that it's not the fault exclusively of young people or the media. Um, those of us who are in the room now who are professors and teachers, um, I think can all agree that you know, if we keep an open mind, we will be continually, year after year, astounded by the intelligence, thoughtfulness, idealism of students. I mean, that's why I teach, because it always keeps me young, 
it always keeps me uh, reinvigorated and hopeful for the future. Um, not everybody is dazzling, right? Um, but enough people to convince me that, that the reason why people are tuning out is not because they're dumb. So I'd like to reject right, right now, like, the, they're not watching the news because they're dumb argument, okay? Um, but there's also another argument that people make is it's the fault of the media because the media is, you know, dumb or whatever. Um, and uh, I think that that argument also has its weaknesses. The strength of the argument, the bash the media argument, is that we know that fewer and fewer big corporations control more and more of the media. That's bad, right? We know that the news hole, the space for news in a newspaper, has shrunk. That's also bad. We also know that state house reporting is going down. International news bureaus are diminishing. Um, and that the news can be driven by corporate interests and political considerations. So all of that is bad. But we also have to acknowledge that really good reporting happens every day in every city. Um, and that we can get a reasonable view of what's going on by reading the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, uh, watching the BBC, and picking and choosing from other reputable news sources. Um, there's enough out there from left of center and right of center websites and news organizations that we can get a lot of news news, in fact, that we would trust, but we're not doing that, or many of us are not. Time doesn't permit me to go into um, this in great detail, but my third point is that entertainment, entertainment is surely a culprit. Um, we've always been more entranced by our entertainers than by our politicians. Twenty years ago, Americans were asked how many of the Three Stooges they could name, and 57% uh, could name three or more. I say or more because I think there's Shep and Curly Joe, right? Uh, and then Larry, Curly, and, uh, and Moe. Um, only 17% could name three or more of the Supreme Court justices. So we have a definite disconnect here. In my own uh, research, I asked young people around the country, 96% could name Alicia Keys, the singer. 30% could name one or more Supreme Court justices. 7% could name all three countries that are in the axis of evil. Right? That was uh, George Bush's um, description of Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. Three important countries to know that are in the, uh, the axis of evil, right? Um, in 1968, Walter Cronkite gave his famous remark that we are mired in stalemate in Vietnam. In earlier this year, he made a similar remark about Iraq. How many people uh, heard about Walter Cronkite's remarks about Iraq? Only a few people. And why is that? Well, the quick answer is Walter Cronkite doesn't have his job anymore, right? So. When he says something, no one really cares. Um, but the other answer is that nobody has Walter Cronkite's job. That if we think about our age, it's not marked by our attention to big issues of the day. Our age is, in a way, more marked by our inattention to these issues. Maybe Katrina and 9-11 are the examples, right? Are the counterexamples. But we can't focus as much as we used to. Um, in the 1970s, 6% 6 of sixth graders had televisions in their own room. And if you're a sixth grader, um, now it's uh, about 80%. 80% of sixth graders today have, have TVs in their own room. And that means they're probably not watching even Katie Couric, as interesting as she is. If you're in sixth grade, you're probably not you know, up in your room alone watching Katie Couric, right? Um, so people are not watching, um, watching the news um, as much. 
My fourth point is that when news tries to out-entertain entertainment, it loses every time. Dan Rather, in 1982, did something radical when he was competing against uh, Jennings and Brokaw. He tried wearing a sweater with his uh, suit and tie. Right? And people would write about this. I mean, it's hard to imagine now, right? But people would, uh, would write about, oh, he's wearing a sweater. Will it work? Is he pandering to his audience? You know? um, but now, it would be laughable if Katie Couric well, Katie Kirk does uh, make some fashion choices based on, uh, uh, you know, obviously, and so do the, her male um, uh, anchors who compete with her. But um, the choices do not include choices that would compete with Victoria Sinclair, who's a rival anchor. Victoria Sinclair is the anchor of NakedNews.com, where she takes off her clothes while she's telling you the news. Um, now it's really good that Dan Rather didn't try to compete with Victoria Sinclair when he was still working <laughs> for a whole bunch of reasons, right? Um, but the real reason is that you know we need our journalists clothed for battle. We need our journalists to protect us, um, and uh, we you know Naked News is a show dog, not a watchdog, and we're hoping for journalists who will really protect our interests. We now have um, a situation where no longer are we just competing against, is news just competing against news, but it's competing against thousands, millions of entertainment options. It's competing against Fear Factor, right? A recent episode of, well, it was about a year ago now, of, uh, an episode of Fear Factor, maybe the last episode that I saw, the only episode I saw, was um, two people were competing on Fear Factor. They had a, a bowl of duck embryos, right? And they put it in a blender, right? And so they had this duck embryo soup. And two people competed. Anyone see this episode? Um, yeah, uh, so I'm not crazy. Um, so... Uh, these two people were competing to see who could drink the duck embryos the quickest. And then they would get catapulted off the side of the building, you know, the bungee jumping thing, and if they didn't vom, they were, uh, they were the winner. Right? And the reason why I mention this is because I watched it. Right? I was engaged, and I wasn't watching CNN at the time. Um, and this is the universe that we're uh, competing in. News is competing against Fear Factor and duck embryos. So, what can we do? Um, Yogi Berra once said, if the fans don't come out to the ballpark, you can't stop them. So, what, what do we do to pull them back in? This is my fifth point. I think that we can, we can change the way journalism acts. We can change the focus of journalism. One of the things, and this is maybe easier in broadcast, but I don't think it's only broadcast, we can reintroduce passion into the news. Um, a lot's been said about Fox News and about how Fox News is very right-wing and that's why it's successful, and I think that that's partly true. But I think one of the things that we should give Fox News, even people who are not sympathetic to it, is that it is passionate. Uh, sometimes the passion gets in the way of the facts, and I can talk about that um, uh, later. Sometimes um, some of its practices look more like, to me, like PR than they do news. But still, I think that we can acknowledge that Fox is very political, that people seem to care about politics passionately, and I think that that's very important, that we have to care again about politics. We have a rich American tradition of caring about politics in our press. And on the left, um, Bill Maher and Keith Olbermann and John Stewart also are passionate about politics, and they also get sizable audiences. I think that John Stewart's show is popular in part because it's funny, but also because it's, it's um, very political and cares a lot about, um, about politics. One of the things that we should acknowledge is that 
a good story well told will always pull people in. So I think that those of us who are affiliated with journalism schools and journalism programs have to really remember that that's the brass ring, to get more people by telling important stories well told, um, and that will always attract at least some audience. I think we can offer more roadmaps in our journalism. So for example, um, one of my students once said that following the news was like entering a math class halfway through the semester. We need to help that student who wants to join the news, but when he opens the newspaper, it's kind of indecipherable. So as journalists, those of us who do journalism, we should pay more attention to the casual reader who wants to enter the news flow. But the most important lesson, I think, in changing journalism is that we shouldn't talk down to our readers. This is, I think, the most important lesson. The most important thing that the news executives don't get. So, um, for example, when CNN pulled out four hours of its nightly programming on headline news, pulled out uh, the news stuff and made way for Nancy Grace and Showbiz Tonight, that's bad. Um, in fact, I, I was able to, when I met John, uh, Jonathan Klein, I said that to him. I said the equivalent of stop, you're hurting America. Um, but, uh, not that he listened to me, but, uh, um, and I said to him that uh, I heard that some of my students at my college, some of my students, every once in a while, on a weekend, like to have a drink. I heard that, right? I told this to, to Jonathan Klein. I said, every once in a while, some of my students like to have a drink. And one of the drinks that, that um, anyone who's over maybe 21 needs this explained, but um, um, there's something called jello shots, right? It's like, I, and so I said to Jonathan Klein, I have this idea. I'll bring in jello shots into my class, right? And uh, like he looked at me like I was crazy, right? Um, and I said, no, no, I'm, I'm joking, right? But my point is that most of my students would be horrified if I actually would bring in jello shots into my class. And they'd be horrified for two reasons, at least two reasons. But the first reason is, you know, I'm some, a 40-something-year-old guy. What do I know about how to make a je jello shot? I'd, I'd screw it up, right? That's the first reason. But the second reason is they don't come to the classroom to have a drink, right? If you're a young person, you, you might have a party side and you might have a serious side. Almost everyone does, right? It's the people who don't have both those things. I'm not suggesting you go out and have a jello shot. Um, but it's, it's the people who are in trouble are the people who don't have the party side or don't have the serious side, right? So in the same way, the TV news people should not be trying to mix up jello shots, Nancy Grace, Showbiz Tonight, for their audience. What they need to be doing is being, being the classroom of the media universe. They need to be the place in the media universe where people come to be elevated, where people come to see important things, where people come to hold leaders accountable, to serve them to be more powerful citizens. And that's the thing that media executives are just not getting. Um, and we see the success of the New York Times, the success of the Wall Street Journal, the success of NPR, the New Yorker. These big, very well-produced publications are doing as well as ever. My sixth point is that um, education is a real, is my sixth and final point. Education is a real important part of this um, this picture. A lot of news executives say, what can I do in the newsroom to bring the young people back? 
And I think the answer is that you can't do it alone. I was in New Orleans in one of my trips. I was in New Orleans meeting with a group of African-American middle school students, all in eighth grade, all boys because uh, it was a boys Catholic school. All their families were below the poverty line. And I asked them, who's the Secretary of State? And one of them said, Donald Rumsfeld. I said, no, but that's close. How do you know who Rumsfeld is? You know, an eighth grader knowing the name Rumsfeld is kind of, in my mind, kind of impressive. So he said, well, I read about him on the New York Times online. He says, New, York, uh, uh, New Orleans kid reading the New York Times online. I said, wow, why do you read the New York Times online? He said, my teacher, when I was in sixth grade, asked us to read the New York Times online. And the six other kids who were sitting around the table were going like this. So it turns out that if you give people the assignment and you give them the expectation that they should read the news, follow the news, and then you, ins and you ensure that your schools are politically vibrant, that you're bringing in politicians from the neighborhood, that you're encouraging students to go out into their neighborhoods and change their neighborhoods, it turns out that people start following the news, even at a really young age. Uh, I proposed... Um, in an article about a year and a half ago that every college-bound high school senior should be given a civics SAT test or, you know, the ACT equivalent, whatever. Um, and the idea would be that you'd be asked a few questions about, you know, which party controls the House or the Senate, which of the Koreas is the bad Korea, right? Um, <laughs> And uh, questions like that, you know, we ask our, our people who want to become citizens to uh, take a civics test, why not give it to all 18-year-olds? We won't kick you out, you know, if you fail. But maybe colleges could notice. Maybe colleges could, could notice something like that. Um, in the last 40 years, civic engagement has declined in America. The one counterexample to that is that high school kids and college students volunteer more. And I met with a group of students at Brandeis University in, um, uh, outside of Boston, and I, said, I posed this conundrum to them, and one guy in the back said, I'll tell you why they're volunteering. National Honor Society. And I said, what? Said, yeah, National Honor Society. We volunteer because we have to, to get into colleges. And I said, you're so cynical. How old are you, you know? Um, but at first I was really depressed by this cynical remark, but a lot of people were saying, yeah, that's why we do it, and it's not necessarily depressing, because that means that maybe we can socially engineer all kinds of good behavior. <laughs> maybe we can expect that people will change something in their community. If there was one line on your college application, what have you done to change something politically in your community. Just a little line. It doesn't even have to be an important uh, criterion. Uh, or a line like, you know, how often do you read the newspaper? People would start reading it in high school. Maybe you'd say for the wrong reasons, but I do think that there are things that we can, we can do in our schools. The other thing we can do in our schools is the media literacy people who talk about how bad the media is. And, and many of you went to high schools where they drummed this into you, um, where they say, look, the media is terrible. Um, look at the advertising messages and what they do to women's body image. And that's certainly an important point to, to, um, to talk about. But there's also a counterpoint to that, that look at all the things that the mainstream media have done to hold leaders accountable. Look at all the things that the mainstream media have done to, um, to help us to become more powerful citizens. Trust in the media has gone down in the last 30 years. Trust in the military has gone up in the last 30 years. And I think that we have to distrust the media to some extent. And I think that we have to trust the military to some extent. But what happens when our trust in the media 
dips below our trust in the government. That means that our watchdogs are less trusted than the people that they're trying to watch. And I think that's dangerous. So we need to find media that we can trust. Finally, to conclude, a uh, Columbia University professor, uh, James W. Carey, who died last year, once said that the purpose of journalism is to make sure that we don't get screwed. And I think it's actually the best definition I've ever heard. Um, it's all about democracy. Uh, without an informed citizenry, as a check on power, leaders do outrageous things every time. But without that knowledge, uh, young people yield political power to their elders. And the perfect example of that was about six months ago, Congress raided your pocketbooks. If you're a student and you have a student loan, you'll be paying potentially thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of dollars more over the course of your lifetime. So Congress passed a law raising the interest rates for your student loans. Why do they pick on you? Why do they go for you rather than Social Security? Why do they pick on you? Well, if this midterm election is any, if the past midterm election is any guide for this midterm election, 16% of your age group will vote. If only one out of six of you vote, and only one out of um, four or five of you are following the newspaper, following the news, well, who are they going to pick on? They're going to pick on you. So it's about, it's about your self-interest. It's about becoming powerful citizens who can hold leaders accountable. And I think that, like, The Daily Show is, is really great on this. Every day, Jon Stewart is holding leaders accountable in a funny but yet forceful way. Um, but The Daily Show is not alone in this. The Daily Show relies on the mainstream media to fuel its holding leaders accountable. So the government doesn't want you to know about Abu Ghraib, right? The prison in which Americans abused Iraqis, many of whom were proven by the government to have been innocent. The, the government doesn't want you to know about that. Um, but the mainstream media reported on it. The left of center New York Times, the right of center Wall Street Journal, both reported on issues like this. Um, and this is, uh, this is what it's about, contrasting what a leader says with the facts as we know them, contrasting what a leader says with, a, with what the leader said two years ago. This is what The Daily Show is all about. This is what the mainstream media uh, should be about and sometimes is. But without that, we have a power vacuum. And here's where the F word comes in, as promised. Without a check on power, when elections are swayed by slogans and vague patriotic notions, the seeds are planted for, and here's the F word, fascism. I'm not saying that the U.S. is a fascist country, but I am saying that the absence of checks and balances means that fascism seeds could one day be planted in the future. The president of my college um, often says that we are one generation away from barbarism. And I think that Nazi Germany was a good proof of that they, you know, a generation before Nazi Germany, they were not barbaric, right? We are always one generation away from barbarism. Sandra Day O'Connor, the Republican appointed um, Supreme Court Justice, said it takes a lot of degeneration before a country falls into dictatorship, but we should avoid these ends by avoiding these beginnings. Could it really get so bad here? Could we have a um, unchecked power? Well, I think that um, those of us who are following the news in the last few months started to get nervous. Um, for the first time since the Lincoln administration, habeas corpus has been suspended. Um, for the first time in a long time, 
um, the right to a trial among not only people that the president can designate as enemy combatants, but really the president can designate really not only you know, foreign terrorists, but anyone who's not a U.S. citizen. And does that mean that if there's another terrorist attack, that the president, that a future president, whether Democratic or Republican, can start designating Americans as enemy combatants? It may happen. It's, it hasn't happened yet. But I'm not telling you today that that's a bad thing. I'm not saying that suspending habeas corpus is a bad thing. That's not, my job is not to be partisan here. My job is to say that the discussion has to be had and that we have to have enough information to make that decision so that you can be politically powerful. It's been said that America's a system designed by geniuses so that it could be run by idiots. But I don't think this is entirely true. The Constitution does provide checks and balances against the excesses of politicians. But there's no check in the Constitution. The Constitution, in all its beautiful pages and passages, there's no check against the long-term neglect by the people themselves. We need to hold our leaders accountable, um, and we need news to do so. And I believe that our democracy depends on it. So I'll take questions if you have them. <laughs> questions, questions, fights, anything that uh, anything you want to throw up here. Remarks. Just go up to the microphone. Thank you, sir. For example, that the people also another reason people give is also time. I don't have time for the news, but the average American watches about three hours of uh, tel entertainment television a day. The average Amer American male college student spends a lot of time um, watching sports, uh, playing computer games. Um, so time, I don't believe, is the factor. I believe it's a media choice that people no longer feel that, um, that the news helps them. One of the reasons that, that people follow the news is to aid them in conversation. Uh, depending on your crowd, if you don't know, um, you know, if, you, if you're sitting around the cafeteria table, if you're a student, and someone says, did you hear that Jennifer Aniston is engaged, right? and you say, who's Jennifer Aniston? The college students around the table will always say you know, to themselves, what are you, an idiot? You know, where, where have you been? Everyone knows who Jennifer Aniston is. Oh, she's the person on Friends. Friends, what's that? I mean, you can't imagine how tuned out you'd seem around that cafeteria table. But if you said, did you hear that Antonin Scalia went duck hunting with Dick Cheney? And they say, who's Antonin Scalia? Nobody would say, you know, who is this person? Where's this person been living? Although Antonin Scalia, Supreme Court Justice, is arguably infinitely more important to your lives than Jennifer Aniston is. Although Jennifer Aniston might speak to you on a kind of visceral gut level, um, and maybe she's, she tells a story that's more important to your life, more imperative to your life, um, than Antonin Scalia's story. But still, we need to know this stuff if we want to be politically powerful. But I, did I, did I, did you yeah. want to ask a follow-up or? You made a follow-up. Okay. Yep, but thank you. Thanks. I was just wondering if uh, perhaps some of the low attention in the media might be that there's now so much uh, different, so many different news sources with so many different opinions, a lot of people find it hard to decide which of these news sources they can trust and rely on, and so they just say, you know, screw it, I'm not going to go to that much effort to find trustworthy news. Right. And as someone once said that there's, uh, everyone has a right to his or her own opinions, but they don't have a right to his or her own facts, right? 
We have, to, we have to have a set of facts that we agree on. And oftentimes we see by looking at you know, TV, um, talking heads, and people are just arguing over things and they seem like they're speaking almost completely different languages. So who can we trust? Um, I, think that, I think there's a lot said about what we can't trust, but I would argue, unlike most media critics, that we should agree on a certain set of things that we can trust. Um, so for example, the New York Times is left of center, um, editorially, and the um, Wall Street Journal is right of center editorially. But I think that most reasonable people, if they would read articles in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, would not know how the reporter voted and could assemble a reasonable view of, let's say, American political dialogue. Now, maybe that's a little bit less true with worldwide issues and certainly many political perspectives that other people in other countries in the world share um, might drop by the wayside because American political dialogue is more narrow than, uh, than worldwide political dialogue. But I think that we can, if we're really trying, uh, we can find news that informs us, that makes us powerful, um, and that uh, you know, can give us just, just more information. If we agree that we should start or in, encourage our kids to watch the news, read newspapers and all that in high school, what would you say to the, the children that do? Like I have my, my daughters, um, I do try to encourage them to read and all of that, but then they come up against their teachers who have their point of views, and then they go against my daughter who is trying to form her point of views and they clash, and then so it makes my daughter, well, oh, never mind. What would you say, what would, you know, we need to go back to educate, but then I think we need to educate not only the students that are still in school, but some of the teachers also. Yeah, that's a great point. And you know, the other, the other part of this is that we no longer, it's not like the teenagers of today are the first people to tune out. It was the people who came of age in the 70s and 80s, which are made, the, the parents of the people and the teachers of the, the teenagers of today. So we, we have a lot of work to do educating teachers about the importance of news, the importance of um, uh, current events classes, and the importance of getting students to be politically engaged and prepare them to be politically powerful. So I think that we have a lot of work to do in the schools and you know part of it um, I'm no expert in No Child Left Behind, but I think that um, uh, a fairly common criticism that I've heard is that civics classes have, like art classes and music, kind of taken a back seat to the things that get nationally tested on No Child Left Behind, um, math and reading. And I think that math and reading should definitely be tested, um, at least on the local level and perhaps on the national level. But when we throw in tests and exclude civics, political engagement, I think that, um, that people start teaching to the, the test and news is excluded. Maybe we have time for just the people who are standing. Go ahead. Um, I know the, the title of your lecture is Why Americans Under 40 Don't Follow the News. Uh, could, can you comment on how Americans' level of civic engagement, how it compares to other developed countries within the world? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, Certainly we know that uh, civic engagement, um, if we look at news interest and political knowledge, um, we know anecdotally, if we hear from people who come abroad, studied abroad in, uh, in Europe, that a lot of people report back saying, well, you know, the people that I spoke to in this German wine bar knew about Rumsfeld, and I didn't know, and I'm an American, so I had to go back and uh, to research him, right? So, we know that, that, um, that for many Europeans, college students, unlike many college students who kind of avoid the political discussion because they think that it'll lead to strife, um, this is like, you know, favorite sport among many Europeans. They'll fight over, you know, political issues and talk about American foreign policy and stuff like that. So, um, so certainly 
um, political interest in most European countries uh, is much higher than in the United States. That has also declined, along with reading a newspaper. But reading the newspaper in Germany, even though it's declined, it's declined to our you know, 1960s level, which has in turn declined to our 2006 level, which is much lower. So, um, so they're still more engaged. Um, I think civic engagement is hard to judge. I know that, you know, as I said before, we are civically, young people are more civically engaged than ever before if you include, if you exclude politics, if you exclude news, and include volunteerism. A lot of people doing alternative spring breaks, which is great. Um, and there's nothing better than seeing someone who's done a lot of volunteer work, alternative spring breaks, suddenly the light bulb goes off, off on top of his, his or her head saying, oh wait, now I understand the political underpinnings of this social problem, and I understand that there's also something to be fixed politically as well. Hi, I'm a grad student. I'm working on a thesis that incorporates uh, civic engagement into the, the college public speaking classroom. Um, and I was wondering, uh, the research I've done shows a lot of this has been done at earlier levels, but not so much at the college level. And I'm wondering, is it too late for college students? Too late for college students to be? To really, to get the habit that you were talking about, to, to get into that habit. No, I think, I think anecdotally, I, I mean, I've heard a lot of people say that their first job out of college, um, in the past, people say, and, and older news executives that I've spoken to say, oh yeah, yeah, they're, they're tuned out, but once they get their first job, they will, they get their first job, they're 23 years old, they'll get their first great job, they'll get married, they'll be 23, they'll get married, right? They'll have their first kid at 24. You know, that's the older idea of when young people get their first job, spouse, and, um, and kids, right? But that's actually young, it's actually older than, than that, right? Your typical first uh, real good job is maybe in your mid to late 20s. You moved out of your family's house a little bit later now, and you've moved and you've had your kids a little bit later. So that's been creeping up over the last 30 or 40 years. My worry, and I think that this is supported by the data, is that um, it's crept up beyond the college years, those first, the, the first good job, the, the spouse and the kids and the house have crept up in age past the point where the news habit can be cultivated. So I think it's that, there's a magical number, I don't know what the number is, but there's some magical number for most people, that's, let's say it's 25, that we're maybe prolonging our adolescence beyond that, um, that magical number so we're no longer um, we're no longer politically viable or politically active. But I should mention one other thing, though. If we brought back the draft, um, that would really interest. Uh, that would increase news interest among twenty-something people. And you know, it, it always when I mention that, it always gets kind of a laugh. There are a lot of serious people, particularly on the left, but uh, across the political spectrum that feel that, um, that bringing back the draft would be a good idea. Um, as the father of a 16-year-old, uh, um, you know, uh, I, I certainly would worry about the draft coming back, but yet you could argue that maybe we'd be less likely to get into any wars if everyone would be going. Um, and you could, you could probably make the argument that the reason why there are not protests in the streets about the Iraq war is because unlike the protests in the streets during the Vietnam era, um, there is no immediate consequence for most college students. Yeah, last question. Okay, thanks. And um, this question kind of falls on from the earlier one about Europe. Um, I moved here from the UK about two years ago, and what's happened to my level of news awareness since I moved to the States is it's plummeted. And the reason is that in Britain I could be an, a passive consumer of news, um, because the news was on the television, on every single television station, the news was on every radio station, on the hour I heard a bulletin. Um, whereas here it's incredibly easy to avoid the news. 
do we need some kind of broadcasting regulation where channels like MTV are required to have some kind of news broadcast at some point during the day, do you think? Yeah, that's an excellent question. How many, um, how many channels do they have? In, I've been Britain to Britain in like five years, but... Um, it's changing. Um, if you have a Digibox, which is digital TV, you can now have about 70 channels. Seven zero. Yeah. yeah. Um, and some, if you have satellite, you can have the same numbers you have here. But there are um, more regulations that require broadcasters to have news broadcasts. Right. Yeah, so, um, so Britain is a few years behind us, right, in terms of, well, it depends on how you define it behind us, but they're behind us in terms of the number of entertainment channels that they offer, right? Um, and so it, I think it's very interesting for many people in Europe to kind of watch us and see where they're going to be in five or ten years. Um, so yes, and, you know, I, I, remember, I remember when I was um, living in London uh, 20 years ago, we had, uh, we had, you know, four or five channels. Um, and when I was, as a college student, we didn't have TVs in our room. We kind of went downstairs, and there was the news every hour. So you couldn't escape it. Um, the FCC, there used to be a show on, on CBS called In the News. The host, Christopher Glenn, I think, died last week. Um, and uh, it was on in the 1970s. It was around the time when there were cartoons, and it was great, because even though it was short snippets, right, I got enough news to whet my appetite. Um, so absolutely, FCC is, you know, that's, that's the place to start lobbying. Lobby your representatives, your Congress people, your senators, um, and um, lobby them to say that, you know, we need, uh, we need more news fixed on, on TV. So that's a, that's a great idea. We, we need to... Um, we need to cultivate you know, the news habit, and we need to find every single possible way to do that. So it's not only a journalism issue. It's not only a schools issue. It's also the FCC relaxing its, um, its expectations. In other words, 30 years ago, if you didn't operate in the public interest, the expectation for the FCC, if you didn't operate in the public interest, then your license might not be renewed. Um, today, that expectation is just out the window. So we need to look at journalism. We need to look at education. We need to look at our own activities. Um, the perfect, well, your example is, um, is interesting also because it might have been that all of your friends or many of your friends in Britain would talk about the news. So you come to the United States and you have fewer people to talk about it with. And again, news fuels conversation. So if you know that, <coughs> excuse me, if you know that when you go to the cafeteria, you'll get a big laugh if you can refer to the family guy, right? Which is a, a sitcom cartoon that a lot of uh, my students um, watch. Or you'll get a blank stare when you refer to news. You know, what are you gonna watch? You're going to watch the show that fuels your conversation. So uh, I guess in closing, I think that we need to, to really attack this problem from every possible imaginable source because I think the stakes are so high that, uh, you know, maybe I'm exaggerating, but I don't think I am, that I think our democracy is in peril uh, if we do nothing. So I'll be around if you have any questions. So.